G'day everyone, and welcome to the third video in week two of our admin law course. We're still in our time machine for this video, traveling way back over the centuries to look at some of the old common law writs which paved the way for our system of administrative law. In this video, we're going to look at a writ that straddles both administrative law and criminal law. It's called the writ of habeas corpus. We're then going to look at one final writ called the writ of quo warranto. Habeas corpus is a Latin phrase meaning bring us the body. So you can guess in basic terms what this writ does. It enables the court to demand that a person be brought before the court. The court says bring us the body. So into the time machine. We're going back 850 years to the year 1167. England has been under the rule of the Norman kings for a century. King Henry II is on the throne. He's the king who basically invented the idea of the common law. And three years later, he was the king who held the inquest of sheriffs and sacked virtually all of them. In 1167, Henry had some massive problems. There had been a civil war in Normandy, which was the part of France that England was ruled from. That was destabilising. But even worse, a series of popes, starting with Pope Urban II in 1095, had been leading crusades to try to retake the holy lands of the Middle East from the various Muslim powers who ruled. Jerusalem was a particular target. Dying in these crusades was, according to the popes, a sure ticket to heaven. And who were the most effective trained warrior class in England? Why, the knights and the nobles, of course. Many, many of them swore an oath to participate in the Crusades and they headed off to the Holy Land for years at a time. So the very people who were supposed to be ruling parts of England for the king basically took off and left the sheriffs to do it. No wonder the sheriffs got out of hand. One of the powers that the sheriffs had was the power to simply arrest people, hold them in squalid jails and then put them to trial, including trial by ordeal such as burning or drowning, or trial by combat. Being a sheriff was basically a license to be a public sadist in the king's name. None of this made the king any more popular. And so in 1167, he passed a series of laws known as the Assizes of Clarendon. Clause 4 of the Assizes read that if the sheriffs arrested a murderer or a robber or a thief, the sheriffs shall send word to the nearest justice through some intelligent man that they have taken such men, and the justices shall send back word to the sheriffs where they wish those men to be brought before them, and the sheriffs shall bring them before the justices. In other words, the sheriffs were stripped of their power to hold people in jail and punish them. Anyone accused of a serious crime had to be taken before the justices. Now, that would have been well and good if the sheriffs were playing nice, but as we know, the sheriffs were a law unto themselves. And so a person who had been arrested by the sheriffs and who was not brought before the justices, they could seek a writ of habeas corpus. By issuing that writ, the court was saying to the sheriffs, bring us the body. We want the actual person in person, their actual body to be brought before the court. This is a way for those who have been unfairly imprisoned or detained to challenge their detention and seek their release. This concept was reinforced by perhaps the most well-known of all legal documents, the Magna Carta. It says in part, No freeman shall be imprisoned except upon the lawful judgment of his peers or the law of the land. The sheriffs, though, still looked for ways around sending people to the justices. I mean, they would ignore the law if they thought they could get away with it. And if they couldn't get away with it, then they'd do things like delay as long as they could. Eventually, by 1679, the parliament was becoming a much stronger institution and the lords in parliament had had enough. They passed the Habeas Corpus Act 1679, which stated outright that the sheriffs had been disobeying the rules and set in place stringent new procedures. That act, in substance, is still with us. It's one of the most important acts 
that any parliament has ever passed. So what does any of this have to do with administrative law? Well, people are not only detained under the criminal law. Most notably, people in Australia might be detained under immigration law. They might also be detained under health laws, including mental health laws. And they might be detained under a range of laws which are similar to the criminal law, but actually live within the executive government, such as military members who are placed into military jails. And yes, Australia has a military prison at Holsworthy, just outside Sydney. Very, very scary place. In the age of COVID, many thousands of people have been detained for the purpose of quarantine. A person who is held in detention in Australia and who believes that detention is unlawful is still entitled to challenge that detention in ways that are essentially identical to habeas corpus. They can still go to court and challenge their detention. Let's look at a couple of examples. In al Kateb and Godwin, Mr al Kateb, who was an unlawful entrant into Australia, was held in immigration detention. There was an assessment process and it was determined that he was not a refugee with an entitlement to protection in Australia. The statutory provisions which enabled him to be held required him to be held until he was removed from Australia. So the idea is that once it has been determined that a person may not remain in Australia, they can be held in custody until they're removed. The problem for Mr al Kateb was that he was a Palestinian man born in a refugee camp in Kuwait. You see, during the Six-Day War in 1967, many thousands of Palestinians fled from the fighting between Israel and various Arab nations, and they sought refuge in a number of countries, including Kuwait. When Israel then occupied parts of Palestine known as the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the refugees had no way to get home, and there they've remained for 50 years. Mr al Kateb was not a citizen of Kuwait, and Kuwait didn't want him back. He was not a citizen of Palestine, because the country doesn't currently exist under international law. He was not a citizen of Israel. He had no nation to return to. So holding him until he was removed from Australia meant, essentially, holding him permanently. He sought a writ of habeas corpus on the basis that if he could never be returned to his own country, then it made no sense to detain him under a law requiring that he be detained until he could be removed from Australia. Essentially, he was arguing that he was being detained until a condition was fulfilled, but that condition was impossible. Now, the High Court ultimately found by four to three that he could be held in detention. Whether you agree with this or not, the power of habeas corpus is that he was able to bring the government before the court, in this case the High Court, and challenge the legality of his own detention. The al Kateb story had a happy outcome in the end. After seven years in detention, he received a permanent visa in 2007 to remain in Australia. The second case I want to talk about is called Bolton and Bean. Mr Bean was an American Marine, a cook, in Vietnam in 1968. By all accounts, he wasn't much of a soldier. He pretty quickly started dealing in the black market in Vietnam, and he was arrested by military police. He escaped and fled from the city of Da Nang, where he was based, to the capital city of South Vietnam, Saigon. He linked up there with some other deserters who got him some fake travel documents, and he travelled to Sydney. Once he reached Australia, Bean was a fairly busy lad. He had nine children by four different partners, but otherwise managed to keep his head down and avoid attracting attention. In 1982, the US military tracked him down. They asked for the assistance of Australian military police to arrest Bean. You see, as far as they were concerned, he was still in the Marine Corps, as he'd never properly been discharged. Australia and the USA had a treaty under which Australian military police would help to apprehend any American troops who went absent without leave in Australia. Problem is, Bean didn't go absent without leave in Australia. He went absent without leave in South Vietnam. Nothing in the Australian law or treaties gives military police the power to arrest an American soldier who had deserted overseas. 
and so Bean challenged his detention, seeking a writ of habeas corpus. The High Court agreed and ordered that he must be released. Very soon after the High Court case, though, Bean travelled to the USA to visit his dying father. He was arrested off the plane, taken to the Marine headquarters, given a military haircut and a uniform, and then court-martialed. He received a dishonourable discharge from the Marine Corps and was out of custody about seven days after arriving in the USA, in time to see his father. Can you see the power of habeas corpus? A right which was established in the Assizes of Clarendon in 1167 was used by an American deserter in Australia in 1987 to challenge the right of the government to hold him in detention. We are free people. We can only be detained if the law properly allows it. Habeas corpus says so. Finally, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the last of these writs, quo warranto, but it's important that you know it existed. It's no longer used. Quo warranto is Latin for by what warrant or by what authority. It was used when a person didn't want to challenge a decision exactly, but rather they wanted to challenge the authority of the person making the decision. To this day, as we'll soon discover in this course, one of the key questions we have to ask when assessing an administrative decision is whether the person who made the decision actually had the authority to do so. If they did not, the decision can be successfully challenged. So, to this point, we've met five old-fashioned prerogative writs. Certiorari, which brings a matter before the court. Mandamus, which says go and do your duty. Prohibition, which says stop whatever you're doing. Habeas corpus, which says bring us the body. And quo waranto, which says prove to me that you had the authority to make that decision. We have one more video to look at this week. That video looks at what happened when the colonies of Australia became a federation. What happened to those common law writs when the constitution was implemented? One more video to go. I'll see you there. Mm -hmm.